So I wanted to tell you this. Uh, as I've been praying, I've been getting more and more of those, um, I would call them a vision. It's not a trans vision, but it's a vision of some sort. And the other morning I came in here, I think it might have been Friday morning. I got up really early. I couldn't sleep. I came to the house of the Lord and seeking God. I had a word already on my heart. It was a word really about truth is what the word was, was is about. And uh, the introduction, much of the idea of the introduction was already written. And, um, and so, but, I, but I, I prayed and I said, Lord, I really want to know. And I, I was really talking in my mind, thinking more about like every time moving forward than I really have the heart of the Lord on every message. And then you can hear somebody from Christ say, well, I thought you were supposed to do that anyway, preacher. Yeah. And many times we do. We, we hear from the Lord and we believe that we have the heart of the Lord. But what I'm saying is, is that like, I just want to know with certainty. I've never had anything like this happen to me before. As soon as I said that, it was like, I could see a Bible open and it was like a fan was born and there were pages doing like this. Yeah. And all of a sudden I could see Ezekiel and then all of a sudden it stopped on 16. So I grabbed my Bible and I went over there where Vince usually sits or somewhere by one of these lights because I had those lights on the rest of the lights off and I started to read. It's a long chapter. It's like 63 verses. As soon as I started to read it, I felt as though the Lord was saying to me, this is for your nation. This is for your nation. It's not a, it's not a happy word. I don't know what else to do. If the Lord's going to give me, do something like that and show me something like that, I feel like I have to do something with it because the Lord's doing, showing me things, so I have to do it. And he said, this is for your nation. And, and there's a connection to the church in here because it's, it's really a part of it is the church's fault that it is the way that it is. Now, I'm not saying that to beat you up because this stuff been going on in this nation before we was even born, right? And many of you may actually pray for the nation and you may pray for the leaders and we're supposed to do that. We're supposed to pray for our nation and our leaders and we're supposed to pray as the church. We're supposed to be light in the midst of darkness. We're supposed to be salt on the earth. And I don't know that the church as a whole, the Church of America, has really done what it was that she was supposed to do. And I, I'm going to, some of this is going to fold into my message in the introduction. But let me just go ahead and read with you, read to you some of the portions of this long chapter that I felt like the Lord wanted me to share with you. Amen. It says, again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say thus says the Lord God unto Jerusalem. Thy birth and thy nativity of the land of Canaan is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, thy mother a Hittite. And as for thy nativity, in the day thou was born, thy navel was not cut. What I get from that is this, is that he's saying that you came out of something else and you never were really disconnected from what you came out of. Neither was thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pity thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But you were cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that you were born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased in wax and great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thy hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love, and I spread my skirt over thee, and covered thy, thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, says the Lord God. And thou became as mine. And I put a jewel on thy forehead and earrings in thine ears and a beautiful crown upon thy head. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty and played the harlot because of thy renown and ports out thy fornications on everyone that passed by. His it was. Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and of my silver, which I had given thee and made us to thyself images of men and didst commit whoredom. With them. Yeah. 
Thus says the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers and with all the idols of thy abominations and by the blood of thy children, which thou didst give unto them. Behold, therefore, I will gather all thy lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure and all them that thou hast loved with all them that thou hast hated. I will even gather them round about against thee and will discover thy nakedness unto them that they may see all thy nakedness. Nakedness, and I will judge thee as women that break wedlock and shed blood are judged. And I will give thee blood and fury and jealousy. And I will also give thee into their hand. And they shall throw down my imminent place and shall break down my high places. They shall strip thee also of thy clothes and shall take thy fair jewels and leave thee naked and bare. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, I just give you glory and honor, Lord. Lord, your word that was spoken to Jerusalem, Lord God, that I believe that you're saying is that the same thing will come upon this nation when you didn't give me a time. But Lord, you're saying that just as Jerusalem played the harlot against you, oh Lord God, that there's factions within this nation, oh Lord God, that have done the same. That they also have turned themselves wholly over to idolatry, oh Lord God. That they also have allowed certain symbols to be erected in this nation. That they have worshipped in darkness and in secret. The, the veils, they have worshipped in darkness and in secret and they have taken your oil and your incense and they have worshipped false gods, O oh Lord. And that we as a nation have trusted in our own strength, O oh Lord God, instead of continuing to trust in your strength, Lord, that you had built us up to be able to send out missionaries, Lord God, into this world. Yeah. That this was a nation that was built upon the principles whenever you sent the pilgrims over to this land that sought religious freedom that they might seek your face and then while the men slept the enemy came in and he sowed tears. Lord God, we pray and we call upon your holy name. And we ask, oh Lord God, that you would release the power of your Holy Spirit upon the land. We thank you for recent decisions that have been made by the Supreme Court, Lord God. We pray, oh Lord God, that you would cause righteousness to rise in the land. That you would protect your people. That you, oh Lord God, would hold back your wrath upon this nation. Lord God, that you would give us time, Lord God, to continue to preach your glorious gospel. Lord God, we repent as a nation. Lord God, we stand in agreement. Lord God, and we repent for our nation, Lord. And we ask, oh Lord God, that you would have mercy, Lord. Have mercy upon this land. We pray, Lord God, that the gospel of Jesus Christ would go forth with power and anointing. We pray, Lord, that no matter what the days lie ahead, no matter what we may face, that we would be singing when the evening comes, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. What a way to get a message started. Amen. Hallelujah. i tell you one thing, though. I'm going to be obedient to the Lord. Amen. The title of my message this morning is Buy Truth and Sell It Not. And I got a long introduction, and then we're going to get into some scripture. But I was thinking, you know, what the very first uh, act of rebellion recorded in God's word was the result of the serpent's deception. He caused her to yield to his will through his veiled lies. The serpent of the garden is now the dragon that we read about in the end. If the pages of scripture could reveal to us what the diet of this serpent may be, what I'm trying to say is, is that he was a little serpent in the garden, but in the end, in the book of Revelation, chapter 13 and chapter 17, he's now a dragon. Yeah, that's right. Somewhere along the way, he found a diet. Somewhere along the way, he grew. Somewhere along the way, he got strong. We don't like, we don't like to give honor to the enemy, but we got to recognize what the scripture says about our foe. He got big towards the end. He was strong and he was a deceiver. He was never stronger than the God that God's people serve. Sometimes he looked that way to them. Sometimes they shrunk back in fear. But the Lord God of glory, hallelujah, he wants us to know that in the end, he will win. But listen, what is uh, what does the story tell upon the pages of scripture that would have been his diet? I can tell you that if you read the scriptures enough, you'll realize that it's the deception of the nation. He has deceived the nations, even going back to Psalm chapter 2, starting with Egypt, starting with Assyria, uh, Babylon, Persia, Greece, 
Rome, and still even today, I'm telling you, there is so much wickedness going on in this very nation. And I'm not even talking about the stuff you know about. I'm not talking about the stuff, the stuff that you're hearing about on Fox News or whatever flavor of news you watch. I'm talking about beneath the, the underground, in, beneath the scenes, there is straight up satanic wickedness that goes on in this, in this nation. I'm talking about that at the highest levels. There's no question about it. They can call me a conspiracy theorist if that's what they want to do. I'm here to tell you that the whole world is filled with his Jesus. Because he's got a remnant on the earth. He's got a remnant on the earth. He's got a vessel and you're part of that process. And he's got you filled with his life. But let us not be confused and let us not be mistaken. So he feeds upon the nations and his delicacy is the people of God. You turn the pages of scripture and you will see again and again. And I know I talk about this a lot, but let's just face reality. If you read the word of God at face value, you will see how the enemy has repeatedly deceived God's people. And if we're not aware of that, we too can fall prey to deception. He's slicker than we realize, right? Every day, some new frenzy. We're talking about lies. We're talking about deception. And every day, some new frenzy takes us by storm and attempts to change the way we were taught and to think. You know, there was a time, really not that long ago, that America agreed that when we talked about God, we were referring to the God that sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. Like, some of you might be a little too young to know this. And I mean, I, I don't know if you consider me old or not. But I'm just telling you, not that long ago, I can remember when I was in junior high and when I was in high school, that whenever we talked about God, you didn't have to qualify that. You didn't have to clarify that. Right. Now, I do it on purpose. Now, even in South Louisiana, even in South Louisiana, when I'm, when I'm talking to young people, I qualify what I'm talking about. When I say something about God, I add to that. By the way, I'm talking about the God that sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. Yes. And the reason that I do that is because there's just a plethora of ideas out there. People are mixing and, ma and, and, and making their own ideas of what they want to believe and what they want to think. I don't know how all, a lot of times people in the church are very, very uh, protected, very and live in a controlled environment. I don't mean to be crazy about it, but I've been, I was in three rehabs by the time I was 19. It, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's a lot easier if you're in rehab to live, to live yep. sober, yep. right? And then when you get out, now you've got to think. So a lot of times whenever we stay collectively and we're protected mostly and only in the church setting, then what ends up happening is, it is that we're protected from the outside world and we don't spend a whole lot of time with them when we don't necessarily really know what other people are thinking. Right. And so it wasn't that long ago that 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 was the God that we served and the gates have been open and laws purposefully passed to dilute the Christian values that once dominated our society. It was what we knew. It was what we believed. And now the American people are forced to lies and each generation seems to grow weaker. No, it's not seeming. It's obvious. Each generation grows weaker as the dragon grows stronger. And there's a remnant of people, though, on earth who hold to the truth of God. The words in this book of the word of God supply a foundation for a building that is called the church. And hallelujah, that will not crumble. And let me tell you why. Because it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. He said upon this rock he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail. In the end, God is going to win the battle. Amen. And we can win battles today. God wants to give us victory today. Amen? Yeah. Even religion that masks itself in holiness lies, according to Jesus. Jesus read in John chapter 8, verses 43 through 47. I'm reading out of the NASB version. He says, why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. He's talking to the Pharisees. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. 
Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. He told religion that. <laughs> a lot of times we try to talk to people that are not of God. And sometimes there at least there's an opportunity and you can see it in their eyes. You can see the sparkle in their eyes that they're open and that they're ready to receive. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but there's a lot of other people that I've talked to and they're just completely turned off to the idea. Comparing biblical history of Jesus' time in Roman Empire to the current state of American culture, it reveals a lot of similarities, similarities to me. And what I mean by that is the Roman Empire was full of commerce, okay? There was a, there's an old saying that says, all roads lead to Rome. If you know anything about Roman history, there, were, there was a very, uh, co commerce was of the day, Caesar and, and the Roman Empire would conquer other nations and they would allow them to continue to exist uh, as long as they paid their taxes to Caesar. And that's the whole story. You know, Israel and Jerusalem is just one little small spot within a vast Roman Empire. And we get a story in the Bible that gives us some understanding of what was going on then. We learned that in the scriptures that the Jewish people hated uh, tax collectors. And the reason they hated tax collectors, we know Matthew was a tax collector, but the reason they hated them was because they were of their own people and they would extort their own people and take more to line their own pockets and then they would give the rest to Caesar that was needed. So we just see that little piece of information. That's just one nation state known as Israel, a little small nation in the midst of a vast Roman Empire. There were other nations that were also vassal nations, meaning that they were under the leadership of Rome. And as long as they did what Caesar said, which is a type of antichrist in a sense, as long as they did what Caesar said, he would allow them to continue to exist. He would allow them to continue to go through their routine. He would allow them to continue to have their religion to offer up sacrifices and to do all of these things, but they just had to pay their taxes. So, but all roads lead to Rome. And the Roman Empire went all the way over here from the from Italy in the east, all the way across by where Iraq is, and came all the way back down into Egypt. And so you had spices from India that would come from there, things that were coming from Italy, and all of these roads were converging, and there was great commerce. And so in the midst of all of that, what is your point, preacher? My point is, is that not only was there people from different lands, but there was different cultures. Different cultures of different people groups that had different gods and deities that they worshipped and served. And so on any given day, you can have multiple people that believe in multiple thoughts. This is the world that Jesus was brought into. Israel, in the midst of this world, was a little tiny nation. And they, they really, at this point in time, they had no power. They had lost all of their power because of their rebellion. And nobody was paying any attention to them, especially not in Jerusalem. They, the, the Roman people thought that they were like poor and, and weak. I can, I can remember, like, again, I've said this before, but I turned 10 in Singapore, and I was exposed to and made aware at an early age of, a, of this kind of thing. You know, Singapore is kind of like, I would say, a little bitty mini version in Asia of America in the sense of a melting pot. You got Europeans over there. You got people from from. Indonesia, you got people from India, you have people from China, you have people from America, you have people from Britain, Australia, all these different places. And so you have a bunch of different thought processes. But the main idea is, is that the God that they typically serve, if my, if my memory serves me correctly, at least in those days back in the 70s, was Buddha. And so you'd see Buddha statues everywhere, but you'd also see those Indian gods with the multiple arms, and we would take field trips. I went to the Singapore American School. Bill went to that school, too. That's kind of funny. But, uh, and, 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 and so we would go on these field trips, and we would go, and, we, and they had all these 
weird gods everywhere. And I can remember being a little kid, and even the, the year that we were there, I don't remember what year it was, the Chinese year, but they were dancing in the street. Y'all probably seen it on TV before, where there'd be like five or six people, and they'd have over their head like a dragon costume, and they would all work in unison like that, and they were going through the street. And I can remember being a kid, and I'm thinking the whole time, this isn't God. And I would see Buddha, and I would think that I was just like a little 10-year-old, okay, raised a little Catholic boy. I didn't know nothing, but I didn't know this. This wasn't God. What All these statues that they have here, these aren't God. You know, and, and, to, the, and to the world's mind, you, you silly little American boy. You silly little American boy. You don't even know what's going on in this world. There's so many gods, and there's so many beliefs, and there's so many opportunities for people to believe in whatever they want to believe in, you silly little American privileged boy. But one of the things that I'm, that I'm so grateful about this nation is that I did grow up in a time in this nation know that God was God and he sent his son. He sent his son to die on the cross for the sins of the human race. And that's God. And during the time frame of the Roman Empire, it was like it is today. I was about probably in the 80s or 90s that I started to notice a change. In, in the country, what I'm saying, even in Louisiana, as the borders became open, it probably happened faster on the West Coast than the East Coast. I mean, you might have, you probably saw it in New Jersey before I did, but the point is, is that it took a little while for it to trickle down into Louisiana. But there were more gods, there was more Buddhism going on, there was more, let's be, let's be mindful of the other people's ways of life. And I'm not trying to take away anybody else's way of life. But don't take away my way of life and my way of faith. And then, you know, it wasn't that long ago that one of the presidents said, we're no longer a Christian nation. That's what you say, bud. But you got enough Christians still in this nation that if we'd wake up and we'd start to call upon the, the God of glory, hallelujah, he have mercy on us because he still wants to use us because he wants truth to be spoken to a lost and a dying world. A land that I firmly believe that no matter the complete backstory, it's been blessed by the hand of God. He has used our great nation to send more missionaries throughout the world, and much of the American church still partakes in that endeavor. Listen, you, a local church in Patterson, Louisiana, we there is a great, I'm telling you, I mean, it's a, it's a small work compared to what some people would imagine, but it's a big work that Gaudi spearheaded and that the Holy Spirit through Gaudi is spearheading. There is a lot of souls coming into the kingdom, and we are helping to finance that. And that is a great thing, church. I'm telling you right now, it's a great thing because that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to minister to the nations. That was his, now listen to me. What did he say in the Great Commission? Can somebody remember what he said? Go ye. Go ye into all the world. What? Preach the gospel, right? Make disciples of all men, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what the Lord said to do. Amen? Look, America, though, has, I hate to say it, become like Ezekiel's prophecy. She's played the harlot with corruption. It's so much worse than we could talk about. And what concerns me the most is that the church has allowed political opinions to divide her from her main purpose on earth. I'm so done with this one thinking that, the, that it's all the Democrats' fault. Come on, somebody. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now. I'll tell, look you in the camera and tell you I believe in smaller government. And I believe in letting people work. And I believe in letting people live their life. And I believe if you'll do that, you'd be amazed at how prosperous we could be if you get your dirty hands out of our pocketbook and let us go to work. And if we had people that were willing to work, I believe in that. I believe in smaller government. I believe in less taxation. I believe if you're going to tax us, represent us, and when we put you in office, do what you said you were going to do when we voted for you. I believe in all that. But I'm going to tell you right now, don't sit here and tell me that it's all the Democrat Party's fault. No. no. It's not. And I'm going, to buy, I'm going to talk about it a little bit. As a whole, the church had fallen asleep while she slept. The enemy came in and he sowed tears among the weed. What concerns me the most, again, we've allowed this division to take place. 
God wants his kingdom to be unified. Not our kingdom, not our kingdom would come upon this earth, but that Jesus would establish his reign yeah. as sovereign upon the land. Right. I remember in the 80s, when I was a young man in the 80s, I was influenced politically by others. I'm not saying it was all bad. I, I didn't have a political position before that. I just remember when I turned 18, my mom said, you need to go sign up over there. They're going to put you in jail. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, sign up for the draft, I guess. And then you was able to vote. But I had never voted until I was in the 80s. I was married at the time. One of my family members was very politically activated, right? And I was influenced by him. I will say that there is right and there's wrong in the political world. I just said that, but this is just a small example of the deception that I'm just going to, I'm not even really exposing anything, but some of you people that are a little bit younger, you may not even know this. Okay. And, but I'm going to say it. The Republican party championed Ronald Reagan as the answer for the day, mostly because of his trickle down economics. What's the idea? He cut taxes, and the thought was that the increased revenue in the average American pocket was used to purchase, and the purchase has increased revenue for businesses, and through prosperity, everyone benefited. Listen, the church was all behind Ronald Reagan. They still talk about Reagan today. Church folk that are Republican activists still champion Ronald Reagan today. Go Ronnie! I wish we could get another Reagan in the office. Don't get mad at me when I'm preaching good because I ain't got to the punchline. He told, he did say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Tear down the wall of communism. You don't remember all that. I remember seeing it all. But let me ask you this. How did we Christians at that time so conveniently ignore the fact that the Reagans practice occultic Magic through yeah, astrology. Right. They hired personal and it was known. It was known by the nation that Nancy was all up in it and that Ronnie was part of it too. Oh, no, they had their personal astrologers. So some people stated that somebody came out that was part of his cabinet and said the nation was ran by the alignments of the planet. We're not going to do this until Jupiter comes right here because Jupiter is the king's planet and we're going to plan it. The connection point so far is that Israel as a nation was deceived. Jerusalem as a city had given herself over to idolatry and allowed herself to be sold into the lies of the dragon. America today has allowed the same. The corruption in the land is so grave that, and yet we have become so anesthetized that we act like it's not even here. Let me tell you what is also in the land besides deception and lies. I said it once, but I'm going to say it again. You're here. No, really, you, you are a vessel that holds the light of God, amen? I know this is a heavy message so far, but let me just bring a little bit of clarity here. It is not hopeless, hallelujah. You and I hold the light. You and I hold the gospel of truth on the inside of us, and the world has hope, hallelujah, because you and I are still here, that the Holy Spirit is still here. When I say you and I, I mean the church is still here. God has a remnant, and God has a purpose for his church. Amen. And it's not just for a social gathering. I'm not here to pick on nobody else. I'm just trying to make a point. God has a plan for his people, and he wants to use his people. You carry the light of God in these last and darkest days. I firmly believe that God plans to allow the light to burn brightest before the end. I'm about to transition into some scripture here. But I want you to know that my transition is Pontius Pilate. History says that he was the cruelest of men. But I feel kind of sorry for the guy. Uh, he ruled at a time when there was deception and lies. I just explained all of that. There's all these different cultures. There's all these different gods. There's all these different opinions. There were so many options of gods to serve. Israel was a people, but they were weak. Nobody was looking at them. And then one day, out of nowhere, he's face to face with Jesus, the king of the Jews. Now, I don't even think that it means that big of a deal to him at first when he hears all the scuttle. I mean, surely word had made it 
to the praetorium or wherever it was that he lived. At some point in time, he had heard the news that there was a man named Jesus, a Nazarene, that was healing the sick. And that it was causing an uproar, causing crowds. He was hearing about it. But one of the things, I'm getting a little ahead in my notes, one of the things that I read in the past was that, is that Pontius Pilate was under Caesar's microscope. He was under Caesar's microscope because the zealots, and you might not even really know what that is, but one of the disciples' name was Simon the Zealot. Because the zealots wanted their king that was prophesied in the Old Testament, but they were expecting the king that's coming back through the millennial reign of Christ. They weren't looking for the lamb that Zechariah told about that would be pierced for our iniquity. They weren't looking for the Isaiah 53, 50, 53 lamb, they, Savior, Messiah. They were looking for the conquering king. And so they were causing all kind of trouble. They caused little skirmishes, kind of like little clandestine problems. You know, I don't know that they had explosions back then, but they caused a mess. And word was getting back to Caesar. And the story goes, if you read certain historical documents, that Caesar was like, you better get your stuff together over there, boy. I better keep getting my money sent over here. You better hold your stuff together or we won't have to. And so here's Pontius Pilate. He's trying to turn up the heat. He's trying to make things worse for people. He's cruel. And, and, yet, and yet at the same time, he's being pressed and all these things happen. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he's standing face to face with Jesus. And let me tell you, it's hard for us to imagine what that might have felt like. But I got to tell you right now. That even his wife had a horrendous dream. I remember reading in that story. She came out there. She said, don't have anything to do with this man. I can imagine she said, don't do it. It's probably in the window. (laughs) I had a horrible dream about it. Don't have anything to do with him. And he tried to get out of it. Y'all know it. He tried tried to offer him some solutions. (laughs) No, give us his blood. Yeah, we, you know, I'll, you allow me to release to you one, once a year during this season. I got Baraba, Barabbas. Dude, you can't make this stuff up. You break down that name, you know what it is? Bar means son, Abba. Son of Abba, Barabbas. Son of Abba, son of the living king. Then, then one of them's guilty, and the innocent one dies Instead of the guilty one, the guilty one is set free. What? I mean, you can't. That ain't even part of my notes. I just remember. How do you even make this stuff up? You can't. God is so powerful. Hallelujah. And so Pontius Pilate, you know, like I said, dog, I kind of feel sorry for him because it seemed like he tried to squirrel out of the deal. He's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. And there's the person who called himself truth. Look at this conversation real quick. I want you to see this. So this is Jesus. John chapter 18, verse 36. He says, my kingdom is not of this realm. This is the NASB version. I was, man, I tell you, I was looking at that word realm right there. Man, I, I just sat there last night, late last night, just looking, staring at that word realm. Realm. Jesus said, I'm not from this place. I come from a, my kingdom is not of this world. He comes from another realm. He comes from a heavenly abode. He comes from a place that is altogether different than what we know anything about other than what God has revealed to us. And in that place that he comes from is untold power at our disposal. Because of him. Because he's the king of another realm. And God sent that realm down here. Pontius Pilate, so you are a king? Jesus says, for this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my 
voice. Jesus is speaking still today, Christian. He's still speaking today, and if you and I are of the truth, he wants you and I to be able to hear his voice, because there's a whole world out there that is filled with lies, and they're trying to whisper in your ear, and they're trying to convince you that it's okay to do whatever it is that you want to do. The whole world is full of wickedness, lies, and deception. Come on, somebody. Help me out. They tell young people, they will let a young girl go to a doctor's office in some states and have an abortion without their parents even knowing that this is even going on. They say that a teenage girl has the right. No, she still lives in your house and they will let her go and do that. And then now you have to deal with the repercussions and you don't even know what's going on with your little baby. The pain and the heartache because they just did exactly what the Ezekiel prophecy talked about. You take your own children and you burn them in the fire to the false gods. The very thing that they were doing in ancient days, this country has been, has been doing up until recently. They, they say that they passed a law and just killing babies. And listen to me, it's not accidental. This stuff is purposeful. And, 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 then, and then now they tell us, you know, that it's completely normal that, that, you know, men can go use the restroom in a women's bathroom. I was talking to Danielle when I was on the con at the conference in New Orleans, and I went paying attention. I said, there weren't any urinals. I said, I think I walked in the wrong bathroom. I walked out, and I like, what? I did. I walked in the women's bathroom. She said, you ain't got nothing to worry about that. You ain't got nothing to worry about it. You ain't got It's just, it's just ridiculous where we've come. I'm, I could say more. I say it, but I've been saying it wrong. For this I have been born. For this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And I just love this. This is so, dude, I can sit here and just look at this. So, so profound. I underline it. What is truth? I mean, dude, that is a powerful quote right there. Yeah. What is truth? Pontius Pilate, AD 33 or something like that. What is truth? What a stressful situation. Right? He's under all of this stress, all these things that are going on. His wife has the dream. He used to think, you know, I used to think he said it this way, maybe. What is someone is true? You know, like sassy. Kind of thing. That's what I mean. I can't prove to you how he looked when he said it, but I mean, I think about these things like, okay, and what is truth? But now I wonder. I don't know so much that it looked like. I'm kind of wondering if he was rubbing his hand through his hair, or if he was bald, like rubbing his bald head, and more like, but what is truth? Like stress. Because let me tell you something. You've been around true men of God. Whenever the anointing is really flowing, and you can feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit, or when the or when a worship service is going on and the Holy Spirit is 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 in the house and He's tugging on your heart and He's moving upon your heart at that moment in time, and you can feel the power and the anointing. You imagine standing before the King of Glory. You imagine the power emanating off of that, buddy, and think that that's not changing your day. Didn't have enough cup of coffee for this situation, right? Right. I wasn't ready for this. This is stressful. What is truth? How many times has that question through the years, uh, since that memorable day, how many world leaders have asked that question? How many mothers or fathers? How many Christians? How many times have you or I been in a pressured situation and been faced with that, with this question, Jesus standing before you and you asking what is true? I'm just saying, I'm using that proverbially. Like, in other words, you know the truth. You're in a situation. You're being pressured. The enemy's coming against you. And what is he trying to do? He's trying to do the same thing to you that he did to Eve, the first act of rebellion. He's trying to get you to question what is true. That's right. That's it. 
Surely he didn't say da 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 da. Surely it's not going to be that bad if you da 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 da. Surely you'll be okay if you know. No, what? No, really. What is true? I mean, he's a loving God. He's a merciful God. He's long suffering. It'll be all right. Just get you a little something like this, and then you'd be able to say you're sorry to him. That ain't true. You open up the door, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to close the door. We've been down that road, right? You know what I'm talking about. Jesus said to his disciples, let me just say this. How, how many times have we been faced with this pressure, this decision on whether we would choose the truth or a lie? And Jesus said to his disciples that he was going away, but they knew the way. In John chapter 14, he told them, you know the way. Thomas asked him, well, how, but how do we know the way? He said, no, you know the way. He said, I am the truth. Jesus said this. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I don't know that I ever really considered all of this the way that I did early this morning whenever I woke up. When I was thinking about that word realm. When I was thinking about that word realm and I was thinking about a king that was sent from another kingdom and all of the power sent in his person from that kingdom and he's taught and he manifests that power on earth and he revealed it to his disciples and he's telling them you know the way to get back to where I'm going where I'm going you can't come I will return again but you know the way how to get there. What are you talking about? We don't even know where you're going. Oh, you know the way. Because see, John the Baptist said, prepare ye the way for the way. <laughs> prepare the way because he is the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. He is the truth and he's come to reveal that truth to the lost and dying world. And the truth that he has revealed is now on the inside of you. And he wants to use you to be able to reveal that truth to those that do not know the way. Because he wants them. He wants them to know the way. Amen. And that was the next scripture. And you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. In this particular passage of scripture, he's actually talking to the, to the religious leaders. And, and, and they, they can't get it still. They, they can't get the fact that he is the truth. He's been telling, when, when you don't have patience with someone else because they don't see the truth, do you stop and consider your own shortcomings and failure to see the truth that is before you? Or do you only see the spots where they are wrong and you also harbor truth? The reason I'm saying that is this, is that I think, you know, I got a special little angle and perspective as a pastor. And I'm sure that some other people in this place can appreciate that angle or understand what I'm talking about. How we, it's just so many different people with so many different opinions. Yes. And all of the people with the different opinions also have truth on the inside of them. Right. And we all, if we're right in our mind, understand that we don't have all the truth, but yet we have the truth. And many times we believe that things should be done a certain way, and sometimes we might be right. And listen, when I'm talking about this right now, I can tell you right now, I'm not talking about you because I haven't had about six to seven conversations with different people over the last three days. <laughs> but I am trying to make a point. <laughs> that we have the truth in us, but we got to also be reminded of the fact that it wasn't maybe that long ago that we ourselves were struggling with truth. I mean, for me, like, I don't know, it, it ain't, I don't know how long it's been, but it wasn't that long ago that there was a level of truth that I wasn't walking in that I pray to God that I'm walking in today. And if I'm not careful, I might find myself moving backwards and getting critical again and not walking in the level of truth that I'm walking in today. And that we should be cognizant of the fact that as God adds to the body of Christ that people are at differing levels and various understandings about specific parts of the scripture. 
You know, Brother Kirk might be far advanced in one area of the scripture compared to me, and I might be advanced in another area of the scripture, but I have to be willing to, to say, you know, to be patient with my brother, just like I hope that he'd be willing to be patient with me. See, whenever Jesus moved and ministered to people, he was compassionate. Even when he healed people, he did it out of compassion. Everything that he did was out of compassion and love. He was compassionate towards those that were hurting. He was the same mind that was in him to be in us. Yes. Hallelujah. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. The other day, uh, too, about three days before this other vision that happened, I was praying and I... The idea of truth about this message had entered my heart recently. And as I was praying, all of a sudden, there it comes again. And I see these huge, tall walls. And they were prison walls. They were tall. And there was a little door. And on the inside was the yard, if you will. And nobody was dressed in jail clothes. Everybody was dressed in normal clothes. And the reason why is immediately I knew because they weren't guilty. Because they weren't really prisoners, they were Christians. And they weren't guilty. But they were on the other side of this wall. And there was all kind of talk that was taking place, like would be a bunch of chatter, like if you would watch a show and they had background noise that sounded like you were in an office and everybody's talking. And what I realized at that point in time is that it represented the cares of the world. It represented life. It represented all the distractions that are going on in life. And everybody's sitting there talking and everybody's distracted and they're behind these walls and there's a small door and there's in, this, there's in the midst of all that noise and chaos. There's just like this tiny little noise. <coughs> You can't even really hear it. And then there was this one guy that was kind of standing close to the door. And all of a sudden, you could tell that he got his attention. He's like, he looks at somebody, he's like, you hear that? Do you, do you hear that little knock like that? And he walks up and he puts his hand on the doorknob. And literally, he just turns it and the door opens. He just turns the doorknob and the door opens. And then next thing you know, everybody's like, and they just start filing out of the door. And they all just start falling out of the door. And when they do, this big old smile comes on their face. And they start lifting their hands in the air in joy. And it's almost like they have a look of surprise on their face. And they didn't realize that they were actually free the whole time. Free the whole time. And they had allowed themselves to be behind prison walls. And all they had to do was to believe in the one who God sent. And to believe that he was a miracle. Word. They got walked out of there. They didn't have to be in bondage to their physical infirmity. They didn't have to be in bondage to their psychological turmoil. They didn't have to be in bondage to the power of sin. They were free. Free because the king from the other realm had already shown up and done what he was called to do. But help us, Lord, your people called by your name when we prefer to stay behind those prison walls when you already did what needed to be done. And the door is not even locked. My God. The door is not even locked. He just opened it up and he just walked back and he's like, what in the world is this? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And then Danielle tells me this morning, and she didn't know, I didn't say that until her, but she comes in, I'm still laying in bed reading, reading the message, and she says, I've got on this page, I don't remember what she said, it was called Prison <laughs> Men, something, I'm like, okay, you're on a prison men page, but it has something to do with Christians <laughs> that are reunited with their children. Like a man might be in prison for 12 years, never saw his kid, just dreamed that one day he'd be able to throw a football to him or something. And then they showed this, these videos of these men in prison, and they're in prison. And some of them ain't ever getting out unless the Lord intervenes because they end up for life. And they're on their knees. They get their hands in the air and they're worshiping the Lord. And they're like, oh no, I'm going to serve him. Sometimes the days are bad, but I get into the Word and I let the Holy Spirit remind me that my God is good. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself, some of these people more free inside 
there, then what some of us are outside. Lord, help us. The truth that came from the Father's house has the power. He's got a name. His name is Jesus. He came from the Father's house. He came from another realm. And all of that power is available for you and I. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. Hallelujah. I do. This truth is the truth of another kingdom. God is not governed by the rules of this earthly realm. I've been believing that, but I'm about to preach it to you. <laughs> God is not governed by the rules of this earthly realm. Right. He can break in any moment and any time he chooses and he can do whatever he wants right. to do. Let me tell you a testimony about, about this girl. Like, I haven't seen this woman in years. I worked with her at Bayou Pediatrics. I might have mentioned a little bit of it to you recently, but I'm going to say it again. This girl used to be a secretary at Bayou Peds and by the way, be praying because the Lord's opening up a little opportunity for me to start a little Bible study. On I'm going to do two Thursday nights in Homa, and the first one's July the 13th. So if you could just be praying about that, that God's will be doing whatever God's will is. And I, it kind of came together. It wasn't me that made it happen. So praise God. But anyway, there's a young lady that I've told y'all, I've, I've never maybe mentioned her name. She came to church one time, but she's an RN in the clinic I work in. She used to work also with this young lady. She brings this young lady with her to church whenever she goes to church. They went to a house of prayer, like it was a concert, like a worship service, kind of like what we're, hope, what we're planning on doing June, July the 29th. I didn't get the idea from that, but they were, that's what they did. And this young lady that I'm telling you about, I'm not going to say her name because maybe one day she'll come over here and she'll give her testimony. She had hearing aids. She was losing her hearing, and it was affecting her hearing to the point where she was starting to affect her speech. And she's in there, and she's worshiping the Lord. And then all of a sudden, she turns to the girl that, um, that's helping me kind of get this Bible study thing together at home. She taps her. She said, the music just got loud, huh? She's like, no. What you talking about? She's like, oh, my gosh. It's so loud. She said, well, take your hearing aid. She took her hearing aids out. She didn't even really say anything else the next time. She ended up talking to him, and she's like, I think God heals. I think God heals. Like, I can hear. Well, wait, now, hallelujah. This was about a month ago. And so every now and then I get up in there, okay, so how's she doing? <laughs> she's healed. It's even changing the way she speaks. She's speaking normal. She, then, then this last time, last week, I went over there, and I'm like, well, so what's the latest? She said, no, you ain't gonna. She said she went to the doctor because they were about to do surgery on the ear. Her anatomy is completely normal and they can't the surgery. Oh. Hallelujah. Oh, you see, this is what it's supposed to look like when folk get healed. Then she started saying to, to, to my friend, she said, I don't understand why you would do that. I didn't even ask you. Oh, I didn't even ask you. Hallelujah. I would just sit there minding my business. <laughs> And she said, I don't even know. She said, I don't even know his word. I don't even know his word. Why, why would he do that? I need to know his word. And, and that's when that young lady said, well, that's why we're trying to start this Bible study. We need to learn his word. Hallelujah. He's a miracle worker. He just broke through on that young lady. He still does miracles. I believe that. Lord, that we would believe you. Amen. He's a man. He come from another realm. He's a king from another kingdom. He's a miracle worker. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to know the truth, and the truth will set us free, my, my God. God. My God. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is what the psalmist said. I told you what Jesus said. This is what the psalmist said. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh, my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do you ever feel like that? You ever, look, look, sometimes you might feel like you're being come against by family members or friends or even co-workers. But look, you've got to remember something. The Word of God teaches that you're not in a battle against flesh and blood. You're not. You're in a spiritual battle. And so whenever the psalmist, for you and I today, when he's singing this, 
And he's playing the harp and he's singing to his God. He's saying, don't let my enemies exalt over me. Don't let them lord over me and laugh at me. Sometimes you might feel like people are laughing at you. But listen to me, Christian. They're not the one that gets the last laugh. The devil won't get the last laugh. If you will learn to humble yourself and to believe in your God, he will vindicate you. You, But you got to let him go to battle for you. You got to learn how to let your flesh be crucified. You got to learn how to not try to fix it in your own strength. You need to let him fight your battle. For you, and that is not an easy thing to do. The flesh of a human, especially a man, does not want to let his flesh die. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I let my flesh rise up even if I think I'm gonna get, get a whooping. If Matt's in the way, I ain't scared to get a whoop. I've been whooped so many times, it'd just be another day. But that's flesh that wants to rise up and say, I will. Help us, Lord. Yes. Right? Yes. Indeed, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Let us learn to wait on the Lord. Hallelujah. Show up, Lord. Do a work. Those who deal treacher treacherously without cause, they will be ashamed. You that wait on the Lord, you won't be ashamed. But those that are coming against you for, for wrong reasons and trying to make you look bad, the Lord knows how to take care of them, my friend. Right? You ain't supposed to pray. Oh, Lord, I pray for those that despitefully use you because I know your word says that you will heap hot coals upon their head. That is not the way it's supposed to go. I don't believe it. I believe that if you truly humble yourself and you truly pray for those that despitefully use you, what that means is you are allowing your flesh to be crucified. You are allowing yourself to be lowered. And whenever you do that, the Lord, and then especially if you pray for them, hello, just think of the goodness of God if he changed them. What, what if he changed their heart and you're like, oh no, that could never happen. And, and he made them your best friend. <laughs> and, oh no, that's not going to happen. Oh, oh, what's going on there? <laughs> what, the, what if God wanted? And he really changed them to the point where they came to you. And they were like, dude, I am so sorry. I was so wrong. Right, right. And the next thing you know, yeah. there was like this beautiful relationship. Yeah. See, that's the kind of stuff God does. That's, it. that's the kind of stuff. God, that's the business that the Lord does. Yes. But yes. whenever we refuse to let ourselves be lowered, we, we prevent the Holy Spirit from doing those kinds. Of, see, Jesus comes from another realm. That's right. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite scriptures is 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. And, and it says this, What manner of love is this that you have bestowed upon us? Yeah. It, he's, it, he's overwhelmed with the love of the Lord. He's just like, he got a revelation of God's love. And he's like, what is this? Yeah. And, and the word manner there, if you look in the Greek, in the Greek, like y'all you know, some of y'all got y'all's little y'all's commentaries, y'all strongs. If you look in the Greek, it says from another tribe or another place. It comes from another place, my friend. It comes from another realm. The love of God don't look nothing like our love. When the love of God overwhelms your heart, He'll teach you to do things that you could have never done. He will teach you to war from a different position. You might have been a warrior. You might have been, I'm just saying, like you might have been in boxing when you were young. You might have done MMA. I don't know what you did. You might have gotten in fights on the school ground. You might have, who knows, you might have been incarcerated and had to beat up a couple guys or fight for you. I don't know. But now you don't war like that anymore. Now you war from a different posture. You war on your knees. You war in the spirit. You get a hold of the heart of God and you let God show up for you and to go to work for you. And, and when he's going to work for you, listen, he's doing something in you. He allows these things to take place in our life. When I'm over here praying, Lord, please give us unity in the body of Christ. And then all of a sudden it seems like, what? Oh my gosh. It's like, it seems like, everything. I'm just telling you, from my perspective, it's like it's getting flared up. <laughs> I pray for you, and then all of a sudden it's like, I mean, you don't understand what I'm trying to say, but I'm just trying to tell you that sometimes it seems like that. You pray for unity, and what you expect to see, it's kind of like what we see sometimes in these song services, you know what I'm saying? Like, I go up to Sean, hey, brother, I love you, and he prays a great prayer for me, and I 
praying. And it's like we're appreciative of one another. Sean and Pat over there hugging. Pat comes over here, lays his arms around. Like when the Spirit's moving, that's what it looks like. Hallelujah. Right? It don't look like that 24 7. Oh, no. Folks still got tongues. Folks still got their own will. Folks still, you know, folks still got their own pride. And I get it. We all got it. But I do believe this. I do believe as we pray that way and we learn to become mature believers, what's going to happen is these things flare up. But it, you know what it is? It's an opportunity for us to learn what it truly means to walk in the Spirit. See, because this right here, this is an instrument of death. Yes. That's what that is. That's, a, that's like an altar. Yeah. Jesus died as a sacrifice. <laughs> and you and I are supposed to die with him. Mm -hmm. right. So it's already happened in God's mind when we got saved. That's what Romans 6 teaches. Yes. Yes. That's what Galatians 2.20 right. teaches, right? Yes. Multiple passages of scripture when you're baptized into Christ, the old man. That's what it teaches. You've been translated from darkness into light. That's what it teaches. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The old has passed away before all things have become new. You've become a new creature. That's what it means in Ephesians chapter 4. The old man. Take him off. Why, why are we having such a hard time taking him off? Because he wants to live. Yeah. And so we can teach all these things theologically. Sean could appreciate this when we were in nursing school. I'm sure he remembers. They said, your textbook is the didactics. Big old fancy word. What does that mean? Textbook work. You got to learn the information. Now you get some information. Now you got to go into the practical. Yeah. What does that mean? Now you got to actually go to the bedside. You got to... Empty out this person's catheter bag. You got to go start an IV. You got to actually monitor cardiac output on the screen. You got to listen to their heart and see if you hear a murmur. You got to take what you learned in the book and you got to put it into practice. Same thing in the world of an electrician. He learns diagrams. You connect this cord wire to this wire. And if you don't, you learn the hard way, right? Same thing with a plumber. He learns certain things. You got to put this kind of solder on this kind of metal. You do this, da 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 da. Then he goes in and he practices it. Same thing in the roofing industry. You got to know geography, geometry, I mean, all these mathematics. Couldn't be able to calculate this slope and that slope. Then you got to get out there. You got to tear the shingles off. You got to put a new roof on. It's, it's fit learning, and then you got to put it into practice. You learn the scripture. The scripture says Jesus came and died on the cross. The scripture says you put your faith in him. And when you did, the Holy Spirit put you in him. You died with him. You were buried with him. And you have been resurrected to newness of life. And when that happened, the word of God says you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's the truth. That is the truth. Your old man is dead. Yes. But now you got to go out there and run it. Prefer your brother over yourself. Don't think more highly of yourself than what you ought to. Oh, if a man comes into your sanctuary and he's got on nice clothes, what are you going to do? Elevate him? Oh, come sit up here, Mr. Millionaire. Look, we got a chair just for you, sir. Hallelujah. Why don't you sit up over here and we'll, oh, let me get that off of that chair for you. We'll let you sit right there, Mr. Millionaire. And then somebody else comes in and rags. <laughs> I don't think I'll touch you today. Who kind of stinky people. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Who do we think we are? No, we've all been made level at the foot of the cross. This kind of stuff ain't going on in society. This kind of stuff ain't going on in the church. When the Lord really has your heart, He's going to start dealing. He's going to start dealing with us at the deeper level. You get what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to tell the truth. Y'all know what I'm telling you the truth. Y'all know. Hallelujah. The Lord wants to get a hold of our hearts. Amen? Anyway, I went off, but. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. And teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. 
I delight to do your will, oh my God. Your law is within my heart. That means that the word of the Lord is on the inside of you. Jeremiah, the Holy Spirit promised through Jeremiah in chapter 31. He said there's a new covenant coming. And in that new covenant, I'm going to write my law on their heart. Yeah. How are you going to do that, Lord? Because the very Holy Spirit that contains and embodies my law on the earth, he's going to live on the inside of you. You're going to know you're about to do something wrong before you ever do it, Christian. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't you wish we'd listen to the whisper? Help us, Lord, to listen. I delight to do your will. Your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Be holy to this. I love this. I will not restrain my lips, O oh Lord, you know. I will not restrain my lips. See, God is looking for people that will hear the voice of truth, that will believe his truth, that will receive his truth, and then proclaim his truth. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. Psalm 40, verse 11. You, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve. Psalm 30, verse 7. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain to stand strong. Thou did hide thy face, and I was troubled. You ever felt like that before? <clears throat> if you're a mountain, he's making you to stand strong, but sometimes it feels like the Lord's hiding his face, and you feel troubled. I, I know, I, even as a pastor, can I let you know, sometimes I feel, like even this morning when I went in to, into the room, I've had trouble sleeping my last couple of days. I mean, it's not, it's nobody's, it's a lot of things. It's not just church stuff. It's just world, you know what I'm saying? And I just, and my mom was in the hospital. Okay. So, but she's doing good by the way, praise God. But so all these different things, right? And so, and, and I never really have caught up on sleep, and it, but it's okay. I like the way that uh, Brother Bill said, but, how, but praise God, after the rapture, you'll be able to sleep and you'll be able to rest as much as you want. And that's true, really. That was a good word. Bro. No, think about it. I mean, sometimes sleep is overrated. But anyway, with the whole thing going on, we feel burdened, right? Sometimes we feel burdened. And when I first walked into the prayer room this morning, I, I got to be honest with you, I felt, a little, I felt a little burdened. And I tried to enter in. A lot of times whenever I first enter in, it just happens. Like, it's not even, it's not even a lot of work, really. Uh, it just, as soon as I say his name, Jesus, it's just, ah, and it's like, oh, hallelujah, there you are, Lord. Yeah. I know he's there the whole time, I get it, but I'm just saying, like, I can notice the difference, yeah. and, th and it didn't happen like that. So then, it's like, okay, <laughs> and I'm like, no, you know what, I just crawled up under the table, <laughs> and I just started just bearing my heart, yeah. because without him, I'm nothing, my friend. I don't learn that the hard way. Without him, I am nothing. I am, but in my weakness, his strength is made. And I just bore my heart to him. And then all of a sudden, I could feel it. It was time to get up. <laughs> it was time to get up and to proclaim his good name. It was time to get up, hallelujah, and to speak the truth. It was time to get up and to be a vessel of righteousness. Amen. And he changed the atmosphere. Praise God. He changed the atmosphere. He'll, he's not a respectful person. That's right. He'll do that for us. But many times, I'm just saying, we, look, I'm not trying to be ugly, but many times we just sit on the other side of that prison wall. Yeah. And we just sit there. And I don't know what I'm going to do. What am I going to do? Yeah. I'm going to tell you what you need to do. You need to, open, you need to put your hand on the knob, turn the knob, and walk yes. out. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because he's already paid the price. He said, I am the door yes. of the yes. sheep. You are free, Christian. Right. Hallelujah. Do you believe that? That's the truth of God's word. Yeah. That is his word. And we need to put faith in what his word says. Amen. Amen. I, cried to the, I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made my supplication. Look at this. Can I tell you how I know God wants to, wants to re free you? This, this right here. I'm going to tell you right now, I know the Lord wants to give you free. You know why? Because he don't want, he, look, look what the psalmist said. I cried to you, O Lord, unto the Lord I made my supplication. 
what profit is there in my blood? The devil telling you he's going to kill you? What profit is in, in, the, in God letting the devil kill you? What profit is there in God letting the devil make you look foolish on the earth? Or what profit is there in God not showing up and ministering to you and filling you up with his Holy Spirit? There's no profit in God for God in that. Look what he says. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare your truth? The dust that you don't want the dust. No, it will. Oh, trust me, Christian. If every Christian decided that they were going to shut their mouth, guess what? The rocks would start crying out to the Lord and the dust of the earth would begin to preach the truth of the gospel if that was what was needed. The heavens will declare his glory. All creation will sing of his glory and his goodness. But that's not the way he wants it to be. No, he created the dust for you and I to walk on. There's no question he made this earth for you and I to inhabit. He made this place for you and I. For a purpose to give himself glory. Hallelujah, I believe that. Look, you're armed with truth. Scripture says, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. You know the beautiful thing about a belt? I mean, we could say a lot about a belt, but a belt is worn very close to the body, and it surrounds you, right? And this particular belt, I've told y'all before, that it, you, you, they would use it to take their long their long garment and they would stick it up and that's what it means to gird the loins. And so what that did was it allowed them to move more freely. So because if you imagine if you was in your wedding gown, if you're a woman, you'd see, and you was trying to run fast or you was trying to engage in warfare, that would be very difficult, right? To run in a long flowing dress like that. Well, the same thing for a man because that's how they wore. And so they gird their loins. When the idea is, is that the belt was close, it surrounded them and it removed obstacles. See, the, the life, the earth that we live on is full of obstacles that are trying to get you off of path. All of the lies and the deceptions of the enemy are trying to get you off path. But the belt of truth, it wants to help to guide you. It wants to help to lead you and guide you in a world that's full of darkness and lies. You and I have to have the word of truth on the inside of us. You know, one of the beautiful things that, about watching this young lady that I've just talked to y'all about, the, hair, the hairdresser, she's like, you know, sometimes now, she said, my morning now is I get me a little cup of coffee and I get my Bible out and I'm just reading. And listen, I'm telling you right now, okay, it's a long story. I'm not going to talk and preach on her, but I'm just trying to make a point. She's reading. She's like, oh my gosh, I got to get ready for work. She has a little hair salon. I don't want to stop. I want to keep reading the Word of God. But she, you know, she said that since these things have changed in her, she says all of a sudden this thought will come into her mind, and she's like, "No, that ain't right. That's not true." How she would have never known that two years ago, last year she would have never known. Listen, last time I talked to y'all, she was on three different psych drugs, and she done she done stopped them. Nobody told her to stop them. The Holy Spirit told her to stop them because they were preventing her from moving forward in the things of God. Hallelujah. She believed God because he was doing this. She has what she told me. He's knocking. And, I'm, and I just want to listen because he's healing her. He's making her whole. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's what truth will do for you. Do you believe that? I believe that. That if I put truth in me, then it's going to start changing the way that I think. It's going to start changing the way that I see. And then the truth, in, then the truth holds in place the breastplate of righteousness. Jesus is your righteousness. Jesus makes you different than the world around you. Amen? You, you and I are righteous, and the belt of truth helps to hold our righteousness in place. The world is unclean. The world is dirty, but good news, good news, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And if you will allow that belt of truth to do what it's called to do, which is to secure, because you got it in your heart, it will keep your breastplate of righteousness where it belongs, and you will be able to live for God because Jesus has already done it for you. Hallelujah. 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 All right, I'll close it. 
I'm going to just ask the music ministry just to sit still just for a second. We're about to close out our service here in a second. But I'm ending with Pontius Pilate. I think this is the first time this has ever hit me. And I think that this is so amazing. <clears throat> because it's almost like he, it's almost like he jabbed, jabbed them all in the eye when he said, okay, y'all going to force my hand in this? All right. And Pontius Pilate preached the truth. <laughs> no, I, I feel like he preached the truth. Well, what are you talking about, preacher? Well, that's what he wrote. That comes out the NASB. Many of the newer versions say it like that. Not Jesus of Nazareth, but they, I mean, either way, it doesn't matter. You get the point. Jesus, the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. And the religious leaders said, no, 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 no. Don't put it like that. Don't say he was the king of the Jews. Say he said he was the king of the Jews. He said what I have written has written. Not backing off. And then, look at this. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. Wow. Oh, hold on one more second. I'm about to add something. Yeah. Boom. Some translations say it wasn't even Hebrew. It was Aramaic. Well, why does that even matter? See, I'm not trying to get all deep on you, but you know what? We need to learn about it. Aramaic was different than Hebrew. It was kind of like I explained it to the to that young lady yesterday. It's kind of like if you have French, Canadian French, Nova Scotian French, Parisian French, and Cajun French. And if you put the story up on a placard in Cajun, somebody that came down here from Paris would say, parlez-vous français? Jesus the Nazarene, king of the Jews. He would be able to read it. Okay, so Aramaic, Hebrew was a, Aramaic was a Semitic language that all of the Shemites could maybe understand. The ones that came from Shem, that's what it used to be an anti-Semite. Those that came from Shem was the whole area of Canaan and the Hebrews were a small group of people that came out of that. So with Aramaic, there was even more people that could read this transcription. So you had all Latin was the Roman language. Before that, Alexander the Great had conquered the known world and the New Testament was written in Greek. The, in Aramaic, all the Shemites could understand it. And here they crucify him because Caesar said, put all them criminals out there in front. That when all these people are walking on Roman roads and they're coming to do commerce and they know who the boss is. And let them see the cruelty of the Roman Empire. And then all they got to do is pay their little taxes. And if they pay their taxes, they'll be okay. And they'll be all safe. But you just put it out there right there in the middle of all that. All that commerce, people coming from a lot plurality of cultures, plurality of gods, all kind of different ideas, and there's a skirmish out there, and things going on with all this action by this cross. Why are these religious people walking over here wagging their head? Oh, you that said you could come down, you could rebuild the temple in three days, you can't even come down off that cross. Oh, how are you going to save anybody? You can't even save yourself. Even the criminals at one point, laughing at him and scoffing at him and mocking at him. All of these people walking by and they're reading that. Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. And it's packed out with people right now. It's Passover. It's Passover time. I'm talking about the multitudes are walking up and down the street. Jesus the Nazarene, king of the Jews. And then three days later, he rises from the dead. But he's still over there? And tombs popping up out of the ground? Oh, no, y'all thought it was just a fairy tale. No, that stuff happened, my friend. The word of the Lord said it. The tombs popped open. Dead people walked. They came alive and they walked. The resurrection power of the Lord changed them and they came back alive. And they walked. How many people you think they what is going on? That's that Nazarene guy that they had on that thing. Y'all didn't see that out there? See? You are that. Yeah. You're that little placard right there. Because that truth is on the inside of you. Hallelujah. Paul said you are, I don't know if it was Paul or Peter, he said you are written epistle. Come on. People out there reading your story, my friend. You got truth on the inside of you. See your musician, Dr. Cohen. We're going to close our service out. We're going to give glory to the king. Amen.